What's going on, SEC Unfiltered? He's Dave Shoemate. I'm Cole Thompson coming to you live right here on the SEC Unfiltered channel, breaking down every single game going into the 2024 season. We got you covered. This is your home for all things SEC. So make sure you hit subscribe down below, the ring notification. That way you don't miss a single preview, a single episode, a single bit of content coming from this channel. And make sure, of course, you're following us on all the socials to keep up to date. TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at SEC Unfiltered. You want to follow Dave on Twitter? It's at SEC. I mean, it's at Mach 10 Sports. Follow me on Twitter at Mr. Cole Thompson. And to keep up with the number one source for all things SEC, make sure you visit secunfiltered.com. This episode is brought to you by Roback. Use promo code SECU for 20% off all joggers, polos, hoodies, shorts, much, much more. Look good, feel good this upcoming fall at Roback.com. Promo code SECU. Dave. This is the second time in program history that these two have met up. And the first time was very much in favor of the Longhorns. 1975, a 46-0 victory. But keep in mind, Colorado State, one of the dark horses to win the Mountain West. They return a ton of production. They didn't lose their star quarterback. They didn't lose their star receiver. They have some pieces in play that if you come out swinging, you might be able to silence the Rams. But if not, they're going to be battering you going into the third quarter. No, you're 100% right. I actually got off the phone before this interview with a guy who used to be a student for me uh, that works in their support staff role there, just at Colorado State over at Fort Collins, just kind of asking them about that roster. He mentioned that like you talked about it, the Braden Fowler and Nicolosi kid, kind of a gunslinger mentality. He's like, I think that maybe could help us in that Texas game. Uh, he also he randomly just mentioned he's like NFL scouts. I think he's the liaison. He said they mentioned the right guard, Drew Moss. And also the center, Jacob Garner, is potential uh, NFL guy. So that should be a good challenge, I think, initially, right off the bat for the Texas defensive line, guys like Alfred Collins on the interior, Bill Norton coming in from Arizona. Uh, you could even throw Vernon Broughton in that conversation as well. Just to kind of a good test, a litmus test right off the bat, game one. This isn't like Arkansas playing Arkansas Pine Bluff. Really. This is a legitimate, you mentioned it, Cole, like an under-the-radar Mountain West team. Uh, he mentioned, like, he's like, I think we should get to six wins this year. He's like, I thought we should have got to six last year. He's like, we're going to be competitive. And I know tech, I know those interior linemen, interior defensive linemen for Texas uh, goes against probably arguably one of the better interior fronts in the country as well every day in practice. Hayden Connor, Jake Major, DJ Campbell as well. So it's nothing they're not used to. But game one, you got to buckle the chin straps. So you can't just roll the ball out there and expect that. Jay Norbell's a good coach. They're confident. Uh, they mentioned they are a little concerned about that heat, 230 heat on that turf. That, that, that could be a little bit of an adjustment for guys coming from the higher altitude in Colorado. Again, I, I think this is a good if – I'm, if I'm Steve Sarkeesian, I think this is a good appetizer to what should be the entree next week when you head to Ann Arbor in the big house. One of the biggest things is that you don't want to go walking into Ann Arbor with not being a little tested. And so you will be if you're Texas. And we have to talk about the major news right now coming out of Austin. No CJ Baxter in 2024. He is out for the year with a PCL, LCL injury. And they're really also missing a couple of other tailbacks because of more injuries have stockpiled up. But they do have Jaden Blue, who I look at on paper, I think is a superstar talent. I think that his ability to win in the open field with that home run speed is something that can be bottled up and be a major weapon for this offense. And then, of course, you bring in an offensive line. I've been on record with this. I think many other people have been on record with this. This might be one of the best offensive lines in the nation. It's certainly a top three offensive line in the SEC, headlined by All-American and Calvin Banks. You bring back Jake Majors. Veteranship when it comes to the offensive trenches. One player gone, right tackle. How are you going to be able to replace the production loss by Christian Jones? But let's go ahead and talk about, of course, what is going to be the major element of this team. It's Quinn Ewers. It has to be Quinn Ewers when you look at what this schedule is. And how many people have been hyping up all of Texas? It starts and ends with number three. Last year, guided them to a Big 12 championship. Last year, got them to a monumental game against Oklahoma State where he had a Big 12 record. Has stepped up big against SEC competition. Played well in the first game against Alabama before the injury. And then played a phenomenal in the second game in the home of Nick Saban. So he's ready for the SEC. But at the same time, you won't have the same supporting cast that guided you to a Sugar Bowl last year. No Adonai Mitchell, no Xavier Worthy, no Jatavian Sanders, no Jonathan Brooks. Now you lose C.J. Baxter. It is a brand new crop of players who could eventually either make or break your success. And when that's the case, and you also have arguably the most famous 
backup quarterback in the history of college football breathing down your neck and fans in the stands have already started clamoring for number 16 to be number one on the depth chart. There comes a little bit of added pressure when every single snap is under watch. No, hundred percent. No, I mean, like you said, quarterback obviously starts with Quinn Ewers. You saw, I think I saw the other day, I saw, I, this wasn't anybody talking to, I saw their practice scrimmage notes. They kind of started off slow offensively. I'm, I'm like you, let's, let, let's come out firing against Colorado State. I, I, I want to see Quinn Ewers come out with a fast start. And my other question would kind of be, who kind of does it feel? And again, I don't think Sark and them are going to really show you a whole lot in this first game completely offensively, obviously. But like, who does it feel like is wide receiver one? Who does it feel like? I know you're high on Matthew Bolden. Uh, you're high, obviously, Isaiah Bond. We all know him. You're also high on Silas Bolden uh, as well. Jonte Cook, could it be him? DeAndre Moore, maybe the freshman Ryan Wingo. Who kind of steps up? Is there – we probably won't know after this first game, but you kind of want to get a feel of, like, hey, who touches the rock first on that outside, on the perimeter game? Maybe it's a jet sweep. Maybe they just throw a little bubble screen, tunnel screen, now screen, get it out. I'm just interested to kind of see from that perspective. We know the running back is, situation. They're looking for somebody after Jaden Blue to kind of step up. Uh, quarterback situation, I'm with you. I want to see Quinn Ewers come out and get a quick, fast start. I would love for Texas to come out there on the first drive and go put a phenomenal drive together four to six play drive, score right off the bat, kind of set the tone to 24. But I want to see who those playmakers on the outside are. That's kind of what I'm looking for initially, just surface level after rolling into this first game against Colorado State. My big thing is figuring out how are you going to replace the production loss by C.J. Baxter. And maybe it's not in terms of is it one player, is it maybe turning to a guy like Wisner to now be a guy that you thought was maybe a third down back. Now he's got to be a primary, secondary option behind Jaden Blue. Maybe there are some plays where they utilize Quinn Ewers. The, the thing about Ewers is people don't give him enough credit. He's a sneaky athlete. And this was a team that the last two years has been mediocre to maybe a little bit above average at best on third and short conversions. If you are able to milk that clock and it is a mainstay in the SEC, you win. That's a bottom line. You and I know this is clear as day. If you're able to control the time of possession nine times out of 10, the one that comes out on top in that stat line is the one that comes out with the W. And so I feel like that when you see Quinn Ewers on third and short, how can you utilize either a quick passing game? Do you get some jet suites mixed in? You know, they had Keelan Robinson on this roster, and there's a lot of similarities between him and Silas Bolden for their ability to be utilized on multi-different facets. Do you get some jet sweeps mixed in? Do you get some quick little shovel passes at the line of scrimmage to be able to move it and cross the uh, you know cross the sticks, pick up a first down? What's going to be the case of how do you make up for CJ Baxter? Because the thing that's really important here that we know this, Dave, this is a team that is going to have running backs that weigh under 215 pounds. So they don't have that physical approach. There's not a single running back now with Baxter on the sidelines that is weighed over 210 pounds. That is a critical factor when it comes to being great on third down, especially in those short yardage situations. That's what made Brax Baxter his MO. That's what made him a standout. I honestly think that they're going to find a way, but this is the good news. You paid Steve Sarkeesian $10 million to now be able to scheme up plays to where you're put in the situation. Let's see what the money's worth, man. This is the time for you to shine because if you kind of have to at this point, yeah, I feel like we hit, we hit on offense. Like defensively, I think they're going to get tested from talking to them at Colorado State. I think they know their guy, the Fowler, Nicolosi kid. I, I watched that. I remember briefly seeing him against Colorado. I remember that two-overtime game that should have been Colorado. Briefly, I hadn't done a lot of film study on him. But they, I think he does kind of have a gunslinger mentality. He's going to take some risk. Maybe they pay off. Maybe they don't. But I do think the Texas secondary is going to get tested. So, how are those Malik Muhammad, Jade Bear, and I mean, you got Andrew Makuba come over from Clemson. Those guys are going to be tested right off the bat. I mean, who, who's playing in that star position? Is it Baron? Who else comes over from that other in the corner spot if it is him? So I think they will be tested that week because I think Colorado State's going to come in with literally nothing to lose in that game. Um, yeah, so I'm kind of excited from that standpoint to see how the Texas back end kind of responds because if I'm Colorado State, that's where I would go attack. Just, hey, let's take our shots. Let's see where we are. Let's see if we can get this game into the second half. Because, I mean, I think they got to be there in the second half, probably with a lead if they even want to have a chance in this game. Because I do think that heat uh, is going to wear them down with a 230 kickoff. Those guys coming over from Fort Collins. They're not going to be used to that. The depth's not going to be there. So it'll be interesting to see Colorado State's initial game plan. Hey, we got to get up early, probably be ahead a little bit early. 
and uh, take advantage some of, of some explosive plays. Maybe, like we mentioned, Quinn Ewers gets off to a slower start. Not saying I believe this is what's going to happen. I just, if there was a path to Colorado State being in this game in the second half, I think that would be it. What's baffling is that the SEC has – extremely talented receivers you and i both know this you got it when you look at georgia they have dominic lovett they're gonna bring in london humphreys they have a really good up-and-comer in colby young you look at kentucky who's gonna be coming into austin later in the season they have talented receivers jamori macklin barian brown dane key you talk about texas a&m they got some talented receivers this might be the most talented receiver that the Longhorns secondary faces all year in Torrey Horton. Torrey Horton is an absolute stud. This was a kid that last year broke out big, over 1,100 receiving yards, eight touchdowns, 11.8 8 yards per play. Go back and remember that Colorado game. He literally took that over by storm. 16 catches, 133 yards, one major touchdown. He was a big reason why that game went into overtime, and he had offers. He had offers from SEC schools, from Big 12 schools, from ACC schools. He was one of the more sought-after players to go ahead and buy in in this NIL collective. But much like what we have already heard about quarterback play, there's something about being a part of a system that just makes it special. And Torrey Horton said, I want to be a reason why Colorado State makes the college football playoff as that group of five school in year one. Because somebody's got to go. So this is going to be a major test, for, I think, for a secondary that last year was known for giving up explosive play after explosive play with a lot of newcomers. You already mentioned Andrew Makuba. He's not a newcomer in terms of a starter, but he is a newcomer in terms of being on the 40 acres. This is a dude that was an all ACC freshman of the year. Can he be that guy over the top? How do you feel about your other secondary positions? How do you feel about Malik Muhammad having to start? How do you feel about maybe a guy like Cole having to play in a small staff, the guy from San, the, uh, San Jose State? These are role players that are going to step up big. Torrey Horton might, in my opinion, be the ultimate litmus test of what you want if you are a secondary coach to figure out can you go toe-to-toe -to -toe with these other receivers? Because I'm not sure you're going to see a better playmaker in the open field than what you're going to see in week one. No, I know. I totally agree. I think it's a good test. I think it's a good first game. It's not your cut. Obviously, if you open up with Michigan, it's whatever. It's, it's game one. It's week one. There's things, there's benefits to having a big game like Georgia Clemson to open up the season and get your guys' attention all off season. But I do think this is a good, I, I like this. I like this. Again, I, I don't think Sark playing this. This game was scheduled for potentially probably his first year there. But I do think this is a good, like I mentioned, I use the word appetizer. I think it's a good appetizer because, again, this isn't just a roll the ball game out. You mentioned I think they're a potential under-the-radar Mountain West team, maybe seeing UNLV or Boise State in the conference championship game out there out West. But I think this, this will be a good litmus test. We'll have a good feel for Texas after this. I mean, they're going to obviously improve. Teams get better as teams get, teams get worse as well. But I think you would. this will be something to tune in. This isn't just a roll the ball out, boring, check a box kind of game. I think Texas is going to have to show up. They're going to have to play well. I think they will. They'll be excited for that first game. And again, like I said, I do think that heat, especially in the second half, middle of the second quarter, is going to start taking its toll in Colorado State. You got to go ahead and pick one player that ends up showing out from the transfer portal. Texas had some really good names that came on over this past offseason. Really big difference makers. That is the main reason why we were talking about Texas being a front runner to win the SEC, be a playoff team. Many of fine folk are not arguing that Texas belongs in the top four of the, of the preseason AP top 25 because of what they added in. If you were going to go ahead and say there's somebody that you believe stands out and immediately puts the SEC on notice, who is that guy? I mean, so they got, what, the three transfer receivers, Bond, Isaiah Bond, Matthew Gold, and Silas Bolden, all transferred into the program this year or other places in 2023. I'm going to go with the guy you just mentioned. I brought him up earlier, too. He's a Texas native. He went to LBJ in Austin, first game back at home in his home state, transferring from Clemson. I'm going to go safety Andrew McCuba. I remember us recruiting him out of high school. Phenomenal kid. That's all he said yesterday. He kind of felt like he hit his peak at Clemson and kind of stopped developing. I think he's fired up to play – uh, one of his last seasons in Austin at the 40 acres, as you mentioned. I, I think he has an interception. I think he has a, I wouldn't say big interception, because I think Texas is going to control this game, but I think he's going to have, make a couple of plays, some pass breakups, an interception that's going to help us be like, okay, maybe they, they did limit some explosive plays, like you said, against a, a good litmus test in that first game against a big time wideout and a quarterback that's going to test you. So I think Andrew McCuba is that guy I would keep, um, I would keep my own because I think they are going to get tested on that back end. I think that secondary is a big one. I would like to say Malik Muhammad if we weren't going transfers. And I would like to say a wide receiver. I think most people know I called Silas Bolden as wide receiver one for this squad. And ultimately, I think by the season's end, 
That is the dude that we are talking about in the same light that we are right now about Isaiah Bond. But whenever you are a quarterback that just needs to get a throw off, what is the one position that you got to target first? It's your security blanket across the middle of the field. It's your tight end. And Amari Nyblak right now is flying under the radar in terms of what could be this weaponry. We saw what he was last year. He reminds me a lot of Kyle Pitts in terms of how they utilize him. You're not going to get the best version of him as a blocker. He's going to offer very little value inside the red zone. That's why you have Gunnar Helm there. That's why you have another tight end that can take some pressure off and run blocking. But from a receiving standpoint, he's a great route runner. He's got good, solid hands. He was a big playmaker at times last year for Alabama with Jalen Milrow. So if you get that type of same guy, and you get a guy that can give you at least 13 yards after the play, he was a big explosive playmaker in uh, Tuscaloosa. You get that version. You're talking about now four different weapons that can win at any level of the field. Short, intermediate, long. Give me a guy that can win at the intermediate. I think Amari Nyblak might end up being one of the better tight ends in the SEC, even though he is joining the, you know, even though Texas is joining the SEC, they kind of took a piece from the SEC and said, no, we're going to make sure that we're good in this aspect. Dave, yeah. plus 35 is the line. Over, under, set, according to FanDuel, at 59 and a half. What are you doing? You touched I'm gonna, it. I'm gonna go Texas 44 13. I think they're just gonna. I, I think Colorado State will just cover. And again, I was talking to Kyle, again the guy who runs recruiting over at Colorado State. I think now you're gonna see a lot of these teams. You heard Kirby Smart mention lack of depth. I think these teams like Texas who think they're gonna be playing three to five extra games potentially down the road, they're gonna be throwing in some young guys, some depth guys in there when they kind of get a lead, just so they can get some film on tape and kind of see where these guys fit in. I think you could see some backdoor covers kind of at that point early in the season. They score late. They put one – again, especially if Colorado State's still playing their quarterback, who, like they said, is a gunslinger. He's going to take some risk. Maybe they score late, get it under the 35. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go some like 44, 44-13, 44-17 would not surprise me at all. I agree with you. You're going to see a lot more backdoor covers, especially in the early part of the season where you're starting to get some second teamers go in. And I think largely you're doing that because you want to make sure that the roster is set on all stages. You feel good about your depth. And so when you get to the third quarter and you're up by 21 or you're up by 28, you really don't care about the line. You don't really care about the betting. I agree with you. I think that Colorado State actually covers this 35 and a half point line because they are going to have their starters out there until late in the fourth quarter. Because for them, this might be their toughest game. And if they can hold their own in the fourth quarter against a second team defense, that might be better than some first team defenses in the Mountain West. So I go 38-20 is the final score. I think that you will see a great performance for Quinn Ewers. I think that you will see this defense corral and get in the backfield. I think they finished with four sacks of the day. But ultimately, I do think that Torrey Horton against a second team Texas defense, some young playmakers, that might be the difference of what we talk about when it comes to a win with the cover and a win that just gets you prepared enough for going against Ann Arbor. And again, this is ultimately what you want to have a good litmus test going in to the big house, especially against a team that's coming off of winning a national title. Great. He's Dave Schumann. I'm Cole Thompson. Make sure that you hit subscribe down below because we're breaking down every single SEC game. We're sickos like that, and this is your home for SEC coverage. Download the podcast version of the show wherever you get your podcast listening systems. Make sure that you're following us on all the social channels, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at SEC Unfiltered for the number one content. Make sure you're following him on Twitter, at Mach 10 Sports. Follow me on Twitter, at Mr. Cole Thompson. And check out all of our great, great work. Your home for SEC coverage. Visit SECUnfiltered.com. He's Dave Shoemate. I'm Cole Thompson. Until next time, Longhorn Nation. Peace.